The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Well, hello, and thank you for joining us for the Future of Work and Family Roundtable webinar from wherever you might be listening across Australia and the wider world. Um, we have more than 200 people registered today, so we expect it to be you know, a really interesting discussion. I'm Emma Walsh. I'm the founder and CEO of Parents at Work, and together with Angela Priestley from Women's Agenda, we're proud to be your hosts. Um, bear with us today as we drive the tech um, to deliver you a, hopefully a really useful and interesting conversation. Well, it goes without saying that we are all living and working in extraordinary times. And I'd like to thank everyone, especially our panellists, for making the time to be with us today. Like many of you, like me, you're probably feeling the strain of what the future and work and family is going to mean for both us personally and professionally. And I think that's why today's discussion is so important. So let me begin by providing some context before I introduce our panellists and hand over to Angela. There we go. <clears throat> So there is no doubt that to ensure Australia is ready to meet the rapiding, rapidly changing nature of caring needs in our society, we must advance the way that we combine work and caring responsibilities. And so as we prepare for you know, a possible nationwide shutdown of services and schools potentially to beat COVID-19, I don't think there's ever been a more important time to actually focus on this. And it's true to say that employers are key to revolutionising the way that we design work and family policies and practices. But to do this, we must identify and address the challenges that prevent or progress, or we really do risk poor health and wellbeing outcomes for Australian families, as certainly we've been you know, given that sort of guidance by government recently. And so I wanted to share with you um, to start with, if you like, the current state of the nation when it comes to work and family, because well, you know, well even before COVID-19, the recent National Working Families Survey reported that overwhelmingly Australians are struggling to look after their own wellbeing and it negatively impacts their family relationships. We know that 62% of Australian working families and carers reported significant difficulties looking after their physical and mental health. Uh, we know that 46% of respondents said that their employers, you know, their, their commitment, if you like, to their job um, was questioned if they used flexible work arrangements for caring for children in particular. And one in five said that they were not comfortable talking to their manager about work and family leave. We also know that the battleground divide, if you like, between home life and work life still exists and many people do feel burdened by the breadwinner and caregiver stereotypes. Now add in COVID-19 into the mix and employers and employees are scrambling to adjust to these new work patterns, locations and caring situations. We know that childcare, school and elderly caring needs are going to be challenged on a colossal scale that we I don't think have ever imagined before. And as will work from home and flexible work policies tested like never before, so employers really are required to adjust to help people manage work and family responsibilities at this time. And that means being ready to support managers also to lead remote teams with complex caring situations. So we look forward to discussing all of this with you today, quite a lot to talk about. And to get us started now, I'd like to hand over to co-host Angela Priestley and she can uh, take us through where we go from here. Thanks, Angela. Sure. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emma. Thank you for outlining uh, some of the issues at play, which are obviously very different and almost like going on steroids, I think, at this current point in time. Um, I wanted to add also that, you know, originally we planned this as an in-person event in Melbourne um, with a really great focus looking at paid parental leave and other things. And uh, we did something similar a few weeks back, maybe it was a couple of months back in Sydney. And um, it's amazing how much you, you, you think back to those times and we now kind of, uh, I think I'll forever be so grateful for those opportunities from here on in. So, but here we are 
on a webinar and I can see there are so many people on the line as well. It's, it's quite incredible, especially as this was pulled together so quickly. And I know that we are waiting for Kate Jenkins to get on the line and I'm sure she will. And um, I know the rest of us panelists also had some technical issues earlier. And I think that is just a time of the a sign of the times that is where we're at. And I know that pretty much everyone listening would be uh, going through similar things as we all try to navigate more around this uh, new world of how we're going to use technology, how we're going to do the video conferencing, how we're going to work from home. And uh, now, particularly if you're living in New South Wales and Victoria ACT, how many of us are going to do it while we have kids in the house as well. Um, so I can tell you, I do have three kids in my house today. I have a little bit of help, thankfully. They are in another room, but I it's 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 a whole new world and we're all in this together trying to figure it out so obviously this conversation is absolutely essential and thank you so much emma for allowing me to be a part of it um so the panelists that we do have today so we do have kate jenkins sex discrimination commissioner from the australian human rights commission and I, i'm sure she i know that she was so excited about speaking on this topic and I know that she feels like she has so much to say, especially with some of the current changes that we've seen over the last week or so. So once she joins us, I'll bring her into the conversation. Um, so we also have uh, Sarah McCain Bartlett, the CEO of the Australian Human Resources Institute. We've got Grant Wardell Johnson, the lead tax partner at KPMG and Kellyanne McDade, partner for employment law at Bacon McKenzie. So I was going to go direct to Kate Jenkins, um, but we will get to Kate uh, once she comes on the line. Uh, so Emma, we might go to the next slide where we talk to uh, Sarah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, that's so. Hello, Sarah. Hello. How are you, Angela? Very well, thank you. And whereabouts in the world? I believe you're in Melbourne. I am in Melbourne. Working from home in Melbourne or have you have you got a nice, uh, have you got a relatively empty office there? Uh, well, we were working um, split, um, split shifts almost. Um, one team working from the office half of the week and one team working from the office um, the other half to try and reduce the um, cross um, infection potential. But um, from this evening, we'll all be working from home full time for the foreseeable yeah. future. Yeah. OK. OK. And so what do you see? I mean, like I said, a lot of these questions that we have now, we, we, we put we, we put together at a bit of a different time. So um, we, we will still try to talk to these questions, but we do need to obviously talk to them in the context of coronavirus as well and, and what it means with so many of us working from home. But, but how do you believe that workplaces are responding to really support employees manage work and caring responsibilities? And how do you see that changing now with this new landscape dealing with coronavirus? Well, um, to I think the question for um, flexible working and for the current situation, the answer is almost the same. And I think that there are three areas that workplaces are focusing on. I think the first area is what policies do we have and how do we need to change them? The second area is does our workplace culture actually support flexible working or mandatory working from home? And what kind of support and training do we actually need to put in place to ensure that policies are implemented in the right way, but also the culture um, changes? So I'll start with talking about um, policies. I think that if we're talking about flexible working, um, and let's talk about parental leave specifically, I think a lot of workplaces often start with making parental leave equally accessible to either parent. But this might still have the words primary carer attached to it. And that then limits the ability of the other parent to access paid parental leave. Mm. Other workplaces might pro provide parental leave split between both parents. But we're now seeing some workplaces providing full parental leave to one parent, even if the other parent is taking their full entitlement. And I understand that Medibank Private um, allows both parents to take their own full entitlement of parental leave if they both work there. Mm. Um, 
of course, flexible working, as um, you've already said, and Emma said, is not just about parental leave. We're seeing more combinations of part-time work, um, taking long service leave and unpaid leave to provide elder care. Um, moving on to how policies um, need to flex for uh, coronavirus. I think, um, Angela, you've spoken about the fact that you have um, three young children at home as we speak. Um, and I think whoever's looking after them is doing an excellent job keeping them quiet or occupied. <laughs> there may be a few bribes in there, I have to say. So there have been a few bribes. Yeah. Um, but um, often um, flexible working provisions and working from home provisions um, specifically say that these are not a substitute for childcare. And we've been advising ARIES members that actually you need to look at that because um, in this situation, it is very likely to be the fact, and actually in some states with schools closing, it is going to be a substitute for childcare. And um, parents are going to have to manage their caring responsibilities against their um, parental, uh, sorry, their caring responsibilities against their um, workplace requirements and, and needs. And that will require some flexibility on both sides of the equation. And so I think, I think that's something um, we need to look at. Um, we also need to look at things like um, the span of hours. A lot of workplaces may have um, seven to seven for flexible working and so if an employee has traditionally worked um, let's say ten till six rather than nine till five um, for a particular reason they may want to start at seven for a few hours um, while somebody else is caring for the children or why they're they're busy on some activity take a couple of hours um, in turn off the work um, side of their dual roles and then come back to that later a bit later in the evening so we do need to be very flexible about um, what the application of um, flexible working policies are at this point in time balancing both the needs of the employee but also the needs um, of the business itself yeah that's a great idea in terms of expanding out the hours because I think what is really, really different here is that, I mean, many of us will be well um, uh, adjusted to the idea of you might have a, a, kid, a child that's sick who might stay home with you and you work from home, but a child who is sick is very different to a child who's not sick and needs some stimulation uh, for an extended period of time. We are talking weeks, if not months, that we might be in this situation. And we are being asked also to do some level of homeschooling, to set them up with different activities, it's not a matter of being able to take them to a trampoline park or something and, and expand their, expend their energy for a few hours and then bring them home. That's not the reality that we're in. We need to be able to get this work done over a long period of time. Um, so I, I imagine also to really rethink uh, uh, what it mean maybe to achieve more outcomes as opposed to hours in the office. Is there anything else that you'd advise there, Sarah? Uh, the other thing that really needs to happen is we need to have one-on-one um, -on -one conversations between managers and employees around what their particular needs and requirements are because everybody's situation is going to be different in this in this case one size well one size never really fits all but in this case it is particularly so Mm, okay, okay. So those sorts of conversations and, and maybe the, would you advise that they, people should be really pushing to have those conversations quite immediately as well, given this is just, this has come on us so quickly? Yes, the conversation should be the key should be goal maybe this week. That's mm. right. The conversation should be happening now. And I'll go on to um, number three rather than number two, which is support and training. Um, so some organisations yep. have really increased the training they provide to um, managers on flexible working. But one of the problems is that the training doesn't always show the managers how to say yes. It needs to show mm. them that all sorts of roles can be done flexibly. Um, you know, before this current crisis, who would have thought that whole call centres could work from home successfully? Mm. It, mm. Even, even a month ago, if a call centre um, worker had asked to work from home or work flexibly, 
I can tell you that the majority answer would have been no. But now we have whole core centres um, set up to work remotely because they have to. Um, there is no choice. So I think that um, we really need to train our managers on how to say yes, how to think about what can be, um, what roles can be performed flexibly, um, looking at what the barriers may be and overcoming those barriers. They can often be overcome through two things, technology and com great communication. And um, then putting a plan in place. And actually, as we speak, I am not at um, our organisation's manager training, which is an intensive on how to manage full-time remote workers when your team is, is full-time remote. Mm. Okay. Okay, so lots of uh, quick adjustments occurring, I think, in different organisations as we speak, as it is in yours right now as well. So Absolutely. we might move on to Grant now. Um, sure. But before I get to Grant, I did just want to make the point that um, anyone listening in, I can see that we have got a lot of attendees there. You can ask questions. So you can see that um, on the little go to control panel, there is a drop down called questions and you can put your questions in there and I'll keep the conversation. If I see things that should come, questions that should come into the conversation now, I'll ask them, but we'll also have those questions for the end of the chat as well. Uh, so Grant, how are you Grant? The lead tax partner well, in you. KPMG. Whereabouts are you Grant today? I'm at home. So KPMG is divided um, its workforce into to blue and white. And I'm on the week where I'm, I've got to stay at home. Although the blue team this week, I think only about 25% are actually in the office. So there's a very high portion of our, our workforce that's actually working from home at the moment. Okay, so you're on the, the white team, that makes you... The, I'm on the white team. The white team, okay. All right, great. So, uh, again, these questions we kind of came up with in a different time and are now adapting and adjusting to our changing situation. But we wanted to hear from you uh, what you think that governments and employers should be doing to support families with childcare relief. And this is a very much a dynamic and changing issue. Um, obviously, so many people with chaotic care situations, changes to work and self-isolation. I can even say in my own experience, my own experience here is that I do have a kid who is in childcare, who is staying home with us at the moment and probably will be staying home for quite some time. So that raises a lot of issues about whether or not um, do, we, do we keep him in childcare? How does it work in terms of the rebate? How does it work in terms of the days that... Um, we can have as him technically being out of care before that rebate gets cut. So what do you think, Grant? So I'll answer that in terms of structural or the sort of the normal um, elements and then add mm -hmm. COVID-19. Okay. So yeah. we've done some reports and they're available on the internet uh, on work disincentive rates, um, which is a term that we've come up with mm -hmm. that others are going to follow. And basically, if you look at working an additional day or the secondary earner working an additional day and you take into account the additional tax that's paid and the loss of um, childcare subsidy, family tax benefit uh, and the additional childcare costs, you have a work disincentive rate in many cases of, of 80% to 90%. In other words, um, the secondary earner and mostly women um, are working for very little. And our, um, I suppose, objective was to find mechanisms to actually reduce that work disincentive rate. Now, one simple way of doing it is just change the levels of um, childcare subsidy and the taper rates. And the taper rates at the moment are terrible because you end up with falling off a cliff twice, mm. uh, depending on your, your income. Um, so, to, or, or there are some other alternatives that we've come up with to actually reduce the work disincentive rate. So that was sort of almost the raison d'etre of why I'm here. Um, mm -hmm. But COVID-19 has changed that environment quite dramatically. Um, we in Australia have a very unfair system, if you like, of full-time versus part-time or not working distribution between men and women with young children. So about 84%, uh, this is heterosexual couples um, with young children, 84% of men would be working full time, 
whereas only 27% of women would be working full time. If you did that stat for Sweden, you'd have quite a few dual income families, um, whereas only 22% of ours are dual income. Um, we have largely what they call a 1.5 um, model, where you have commonly full-time uh, father and a part-time mother. And in terms of COVID-19, it will have strong gender biases because uh, many part-time jobs um, will, will go away before the full-time jobs. Um, so not only will you have financial stress, but you'll also in some cases have um, more going into, uh, I suppose, the box where you have a full-time um, father working and a, a, a mother at home. And I just think that's the gender bias in relation to part-time work. Um, I think the other element of the uh, COVID-19 that's a negative is that budgets in the future will become tighter and our recommendations of the past would cost um, money. Um, so there may be a delay in terms of, of how that operates from a federal budget point of view. I do think there are positives, however. I think the agility um, factor, and KPMG has got an agile workforce anyway, but the number of businesses throughout Australia that are going to be far more agile in their approach to work will be um, a big positive. And there will be some increase in the part-time, part-time type model. Um, and mm. that's that's quite a predominant model in the Netherlands. And so I, I think there are two positives that come out of this. Um, mm. Can I ask you why you think there will sure. be an increase in the part-time, part-time model? Because I think that's interesting going back to, again, where we started with this conversation when we originally looked at organising it, but looking at shared paid parental leave and the impact that ultimately has on gender equality going forward. And I see that as well with a part-time, part-time model. And you can kind of see how in different households and particularly in heterosexual couples and relationships, how you can see how things might move to a part-time, part-time model where families work it out between themselves while they deal with the childcare. So is that what you see yeah, occurring well, or potentially occurring here? That's a positive aspect of it and uh, an mm. important one. Um, but I see we've got such a dominance of full-time males working. Uh, the virus or the financial impact of that will be some of them will move to a part-time basis and therefore mm. it'll increase that that box. I, I think it'll be driven by the economics of that and not mm. necessarily um, the fairness, um, which requires significant cultural shift. Um, what I do think would be good in terms of leave is if a portion of the leave was flexible insofar as it could be taken by both parties, but if a portion was use it or lose it for one parent, in, that would drive um, more fathers taking parental leave and getting mm. used to sharing parental responsibilities. So uh, I think there are some countries in the world that have that, but that's how I would like to see it. So a portion, you can split between yourselves, work out how you do, do that, and maybe um, some will have both, um, but a portion um, you're forced to take or you just lose it. Because mm, mm, you mentioned Sweden before, and I do know definitely that is how it works in Sweden, where I think it's around three months or so, either parent has to take that three months or they will lose it. Yeah. Which which does result in that cultural shift then as well. Um, so sure. could, could you let us know a little bit more about how KPMG is supporting families as part of its future of work and wellbeing strategy, um, how that in terms of its business as usual and anything that you might add in terms of what's occurring right now as well? Um, in terms of our policies, so we've got 24 months parental leave. There's no minimum period before you qualify for that. And 18 weeks paid um, leave, which is for the primary carer. But we have a flexi paid leave policy. So you can take that in whatever way you want. You don't have to take it in consecutive days. And so I think that's um, that's well used. And really importantly, I think we, we've moved to an agile working environment. So we don't have a desk. Um, you don't have to work um, from the office. And that flexibility has been very important um, for many. Um, we've created a father's network. Um, and I, I think 
we have a chairman that culturally um, believes in parental um, equality in or equality in sharing parental responsibilities. And so there is a, a, a cultural move, if you like, to that domain. I'd like to see that much more um, throughout Australia and governments taking initiative as well as um, sort of larger businesses. But um, uh, I think that's an important cultural shift that we're going through. Mm. Okay, okay. Angela. All right. Well, I might move on to... Yes, Angela, Emma. it's Emma. I've now, um, I think, got Kate. Um, I'm just going to unmute so I think Kate can now um, participate. So I'll unmute un uh, her. <laughs> And hopefully that works, okay. Kate Jenkins. Hi, Kate. How are you? Not yet. No. Okay. Well, I'll leave that line okay. open so Kate can um, join us when she can get that because I've unmuted her. That should work. Um, okay. I'll move on to uh, Kellyanne. Um, how are you, Kellyanne? Where are you? Hi. Us from? An employment law uh, at Baker McKenzie. That, that's right, um, but not at Baker McKenzie's offices today. So uh, we've all been working from home since Wednesday of last week. Um, so I'm currently um, trying to stay away from three very small children who are at home and not um, daycare and kindergarten at the moment, which is um, very much the front line of some of the challenges that we're talking about today. <laughs> I, I feel you there. Okay. So, um, okay. So, what again? I mean, we've got some questions there, which we'll get to. I mean, it'd be great to hear your ideas as an employment law expert. What some of those stumbling blocks preventing employers are from getting to more flexible work and gender equal pay. But I mean, first, I might ask. You know, what what do you believe employers should be focused on right now when it comes to the well being of people, particularly parents? Yeah, I mean, it's a particularly um, busy time to be an employment lawyer at the moment um, because there certainly are a lot of questions around what employers can do um, from a legal perspective and also then, you know, from a um, from a company perspective, what they want to do. Um, certainly last week I fielded a lot of calls about um, working from home arrangements and setting up home offices and some of the health and safety issues surrounding that and um, you know there's certainly some some novel um, issues to consider mental health risks involved with isolation and all sorts of things um, but of course those issues and the employment issues generally have now sort of changed again this week um, uh, and as I've mentioned you know personally I'm a, a part-time worker I work flexibly and I try and work from home at least a day a week I have three um, kids under five and so um, it's it's quite a, a, a different type of flexible working arrangement that I'm I'm going to need to implement now compared to what I've been implementing um, up to this point. Um, and certainly I'm sure that I'm uh, in a boat that a lot of people will be in, in that we rely upon kindergarten schools and when that option falls away we rely upon grandparents who are obviously in the high risk category and really not an option from this point on. So I think that the challenges this week are, um, you know, and moving forward are really quite different to anything that we've seen before. And of course, that in turn means that employers are dealing with issues that they really haven't had to um, implement, even if they have had a, a very flexible and agile work, workforce up until this point. I mean, personally, um, for me, um, as an employment and, and safety lawyer, I, I have some concerns about uh, people working two jobs, um, essentially, if they are required to um, continue from home, but then at the same time, they're also a, a carer. Um, there are some fatigue mm -hmm. and some exhaustion and, um, you know, unreasonable working hours type issues that necessarily um, uh, come up in those sorts of circumstances. And we haven't seen these things happen before. Um, mm -hmm. but see has sort of mentioned the fact that we, we do need to be flexible both ways and, you know, the span of hours needs to change. And, and certainly I think some of those arrangements do need to be considered um, closely by employers moving forward. Um, but there are some restrictions on that as well from a legal perspective, um, including the fact that penalty rates are, are ordinarily payable to some employees if they are working beyond a span of hours that's specified in, a, in an industrial instrument like a modern award that applies to those employees. So these are really complicated times um, 
employers to get their heads around. There are a lot of things that haven't yet been properly considered, but certainly there are some organisations that are doing some really innovative things. I mean, we've seen Telstra this week introduce special pandemic leave um, where there's certain circumstances where employees can, can access two weeks leave if they're self-isolating or quarantining. Um, it might be a time where we do give employees access to paid leave entitlements um, or agree to reduce reducing working hours without a reduction in pay. And certainly sort of moving forward, I think there's going to need to be some support given by employers when we're considering considering performance issues. So how do we properly um, performance uh, review the performance of a, a parent who's been having to juggle their home life with their, their work duties for this period of time? So all, all, all issues that are yet to be um, fully considered, but um, certainly some opportunities for employers to really do some things here that will um, set up their workforce for the future. Mm. Can I ask you about, you mentioned, I mean, often, yeah, this is a case of people really taking on two jobs like they haven't necessarily done in this way before and that leads to fatigue and it leads to exhaustion and we take out grandparents it means that many parents can't even get say the break that they may have had even just on the weekend or something that that we're used to um, add to that the fact that we can't have children going to playgrounds and other things which again often is a, a space where parents can get a break from being in in the house with the kids so um, these are important things to bring up and we've talked about this the span of the work hours how that might help but obviously the span of the work hours may also be eating into other times when parents might be sleeping and, and things like that so um, what else can employees do in order to manage the well-being in terms of the safety of their staff as well during this period which leaving aside all of that this is a really emotional period I can't be alone in saying that I feel like an underlying level of anxiety that I've never experienced before um, that everyone is is feeling and we're going through something we just haven't encountered what more can employers be doing in terms of uh, safety from that perspective, emotional safety. Also I might throw in there like the, the physical aspects of that in terms of a, a home office that we might not have really used to this extent before. Yeah, I mean, they're all really good questions. I mean, from a physical point of view, that can that can be a, a relatively easier fix, I suppose. I mean, ordinarily, if you're going to be requiring someone to work from home for an extended period, our, our advice would always be that you do some form of risk assessment over that physical environment um, and, you know, um, send perhaps a, an ergonomic specialist or whoever it might be internally that has that expertise to to perform that risk assessment. Obviously, that is not practical in this current climate mm -hmm. where the entire workforce is home. So, um, really, what we need to do is implement something that is going to be workable. So, we've seen things like um, self assessment checklists where employees are provided with some guidance on what they should be doing um, for their home office setup. They're encouraged to um, raise any concerns or issues that they're having in relation to their home office setup um, with the appropriate manager or, or HR. Um, department. Um, so mm -hmm. from, from that point of view, it's about making some modifications to what um, most organisations will already have there in terms of assessing risks of working from home arrangements. Um, but of course, you know, the mental and wellbeing um, risks are just as important as the physical risks. And I mean, a, a couple of the panellists have already spoken to the fact that really that comes down to the type of support that you're providing with people um, from a communications point of view. So, I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure that most of us on the line have seen, you know, a, a lot of um, organisations that were working from home last week implementing virtual Friday night drinks and, um, you know, mm -hmm. ensuring that we have video conferencing as much as we can so that we can see each other, making sure that managers have now an obligation to be checking in on their staff on a, on a daily basis, picking up the phone more often than emailing. I mean, I think all of those sorts of support mechanisms are going to really come into play here. And of course, we are also advising people to lean heavily on their employee assistance programs. Um, you know, often those, those programs have been underutilised in organisations, but as you say, there's an underlying anxiety um, from employees across the board here. Um, and, you know, employee assistance programs are a great resource for employers to use if, they're be, if their HR departments are being overwhelmed. Mm, okay, okay, I do have, Kate Jenkins now I can see she's on the line but Kelly Kelly and I just want to ask one final question um, regarding Baker McKenzie <coughs> making headlines to become the first law firm to offer 18 weeks of paid parental leave to all parents and removing the primary and secondary carer labels in the process why was that so important to you or to the firm 
Yeah, so I mean, um, similar to what Grant has said about the KPMG policy, um, we have the 18 weeks. Um, I suppose the difference and the, the the reason this made headlines, particularly in an industry like law, which has you know, traditionally been seen as not particularly flexible, family friendly, um, is that there was this um, decision by the firm that we would remove any reference to primary carers leave and secondary carers leave. So there's actually no longer any distinction between the types of carers. So anyone who's participating in the care of the child is entitled to the 18 weeks paid leave. And that really is aimed at moving away from this um, underlying tone of women have babies and are prim primarily responsible for the care of children mm. to people or both parents are raising families and so uh, under this policy all eligible employees <coughs> leave. superannuation is also paid on it which I think is important and the leave can be taken at any time so it can be taken at the same time as the other parent um, or any time um, within the first two years of, of the birth or adoption of a child so we have seen quite a significant take up uh, of this um, new entitlement um, throughout the firm I, I personally have a senior associate in my team who's taken his parental leave in the last few months after the birth of his first child and at the same time as his wife um, and we have a number of um, mm. senior male accessing this now um, including partners of the firm and that of course when we start seeing um, senior men doing these sorts of things really starts to change the conversation and the expectation which hopefully will have a, a flow-on effect and, and normalize this um, so that we can really do our part at the workplace to break down some gender stereotypes that exist beyond the workplace and, and really underlie a lot of our social um, structures. Yes, absolutely. We want to see this normalised. So good to see that it's being taken up. Um, so we do have Kate now. Hello, Kate. How are you and whereabouts are you? <laughs> I'm good. I'm at home like everyone else. Uh, I have been listening to you the whole time. So I must say that I've I do a lot of webinars, but there's a certain degree of, you know, kind of frustration when you're kind of going, I'm here, but I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> you are, thank you. So I imagine that you have a lot to say on this topic, uh, uh, especially today, but um, given what, what's been occurring over the, the last few weeks and how quickly this situation is changing. So what do you see as the urgent challenges that are confronting families at this point in time, Kate? Yes, well, I, I think there are, um, this is not a positive experience for anyone, but there are some things that might um, term uh, prove to be productive for working families. Um, in particular, you know, it seems like there'll be better flexible working arrangements in the future because uh, we are very quickly having to get the technology right and understand how to do it well and and when I say that I in particular look at my 14 year old son who has been schooling online for a week and I can see his work habits forming mm. as I'm watching him he's uh, had very little problem with this he just is really focused and I just feel like all the opportunities in the training you know we didn't have because this isn't how work was done it, we will have a new generation who's schooled at home and who um, understands even if it's for a short time and I also I appreciate mm. at the moment uh, that we maybe are valuing different workers and a lot of those workers are in industries which are dominated by women so mm. carers and nurses and teachers and you know but also scientists and um, and doctors mm. we're really beginning to really appreciate people that we perhaps hadn't paid as much attention to you know we're so desperate for a vaccine and for research to be done really fast and the other positive I have seen which has been interesting and of course I might be a bit biased because I'm the sex discrimination commissioner but it's been interesting seeing some really strong female leadership speak at a time and really create a lot of um a lot of comfort in a time so and in particular I, I know I've seen I've been watching across the states different medical offices and uh, you know this uh, I just happened to see the South Australian medical officer speak over the weekend and she was clear she was um, mm. uh, 
accurate and she was transparent she was compassionate but she really I felt confident and I know we're seeing the Norwegian Prime Minister as usual Jacinda Ardern has come mm. out and I saw a video on the weekend of the, the Korean Foreign Minister who is a woman mm. who just mm. was amazing so those those are some of the positives but in terms of the topic we're talking about it, it does occur to me there's three areas that I thought worth flagging. One is um, what we are learning about flexible work, productive work, how we're valuing it, how we're getting to do it better and the change that that might have over time. The second is looking at caring responsibilities and the current sh change and shift that is now asking us to move what really has in a lot of families become paid caring back to an unpaid role in families and in households. And the last thing that I just wanted to flag was the long-term impact of what's happening now. And in lots of ways how the, there is no doubt that a pandemic like this will potentially amplify inequalities, both immediately but also in the long term. So if I go to those three points just really briefly, one is mm. in terms of flexible work. I, I often, people often say, you know, change will take time in terms of gender equality. And if anyone's heard me speak, I always say, well, no, change doesn't take time. I'm the generation that was all just going to happen because we grew up and we were different people. Mm. Uh, the reality is that isn't how it works because there's really entrenched uh, barriers to women, particularly in the workplace. Uh, but change does, it can take, can be quite rapid and change takes action. And I always think, you know, the first iPhone came in in 2007 and now I am, you know, video calling my mother on the iPad every day, you know, that was almost inconceivable. So I do feel like, um, for those of us who can work from home that, and being really clear that that isn't everyone, it's a particularly privileged group in some de degrees and people who haven't lost their jobs. Um, we are quickly learning how to use the technology differently. We have, we are doing this webinar, even though all the circumstances of how it was originally planned changed. We are also reprioriti reprioriti reprioritizing our work and um, and need for travel. I, I am amazed how much time I've got back as a result mm -hmm. of the travel I'm not doing and some of the things that I would have done that perhaps just don't seem as important in this new world. And I do think where um, more people are learning flexible work, and I, I, I think that will be a fantastic future for flexibility, which is so important, important to equality. But yeah, then we, absolutely. when we've been pushed into this quite suddenly and the effects will live on, we're learning that we might not need to travel for business conferences, that we might not need to travel in the future for, for um, certain meetings. We've, it, it, it's just happened so quickly that we've taken on this technology that was actually always available and we're having little, um, uh, little shifts and adjustments as we go. There's going to be mistakes that are being made. But if anything, people are also aware of that and making allowances for that, you know, that kids may come in, in the background, that we may have the BBC dad moments occurring. It will happen almost like this. During this period, we might begin to see that really be normalised and the little things that we can take on after this. I just want to thank you for bringing out some positives out of this experience, but I'll let you go because I know that you've got the, the your second point yeah. and your third point. Yeah, yeah, no. Good. And also, um, I actually think the positives is the inclusiveness of the technology as well at the Human Rights Commission based in Sydney and live in Melbourne so I do inevitably travel a lot but the Commission is constantly a challenge by how do we get the work we're doing in the work how do we reach remote regional rural areas um, and mm. suddenly provided you've got access to the internet and that that is a big provided but now these conversations that we're having can be heard by people who would never have been able to turn up to our office in Sydney um, so if I go second to the caring responsibilities, we know that while some schools are open and there's a mix, I've got a bit of one of each at home. So I've got a 14 year old who's in year nine who has gone to online learning with his school. I've got a, an 11 year old who's in grade five. She 
in Victoria. This today's her last day of school holidays, and she could not be more delighted with that um, bringing forward school holidays. Um, but I can see as a carer the difference between having a 14 year old who's self sufficient and having a primary school student that you are supporting their learning. That's that's a very different responsibility aside from the school holiday aspect. And what I can foresee is that there will be a very gendered impact on how the sudden need for that um, caring. Now the other speakers have spoken really well on some of the different ways you can in the short term handle that um, but the, the bottom line is it is taking roles that were you know paid or done by babysitters or carers, childcare school and bringing it into the unpaid um, for, forum where we know women already do the majority of the work and it won't just be social norms that might mean that women end up taking on that and foregoing work. It also could be really a practical reality. If you look at the statistics which um, your report showed and also the ABS stats tell us about the disproportionate number of women who work part-time versus men, then the pay gap which shows that invariably men are earning more total remuneration on average 21.3 percent. So we know that um, the reality is we might see a, in, in heterosexual couples we might see a reversion to that 50s kind of single breadwinner um, and single homemaker and that will be at the jeopardy of women. That will be at the cost. Now single parents are going to struggle even more. So there's a real a real gendered impact of this caring responsibilities and how the work and how we might shift. And we know uh, in terms of moving to that long-term impact, from other um, epidemics like Ebola in Africa and SARS and swine flu, what was found in Africa, for example, is that the men's income returned to their pre-outbreak rate at a much faster rate than women's. So we do need to watch that the immediate mm. change will be quite gendered and I'd ask for families to think about that and and if you've you know the man is the full-timer then it might be that the part-time worker which is invariably the women you know is the one that changes that those changes we need to try and plan to make sure that that impact isn't uh, entrenching or sending us backwards. Mm. We'll have to get some of that research off you, Kate, for Women's Agenda because that is really, really interesting and definitely things to keep in mind at the moment. Um, just before I finish off with you, because then we will pass it, there's lots of questions coming through and I want to get to at least some of them. But Kate, can I ask you, um, I mean, maybe this period with everything, oh, sorry, sorry, I've jumped in. Um, did, did you have another point that you wanted to make? Sorry, as we're, we're talking. No, I this. blended my caring with the long term like... impacts. So that was my third okay, point. Good. Yeah. Okay, I thought so, yeah. Um, so I did want to ask, I mean, what actions, I mean, just the final question that we had on the slide there, and maybe just briefly, and then we can get to some of the other questions, but what actions do you really want to see employees working on over the longer term now to better support families? So we're, we're getting through this period, we're out of this period, we've all gotten well acquainted with working um, more flexibly and using technology better, maybe having less flights and less in-person meetings. What do you want to see employers working then on the longer term to support families? Yeah, it's probably a bigger picture in terms of why do we not have gender equality in work mm. um, for men and women right now. And that is um, probably employers being really more conscious on how they might be reinforcing those old fashioned role stereotypes about what men and women are responsible for at work and home. So that that's a way for me to say, if you really think as an employer about that, understand how your parental leave policies work for men and women under understand how managers you know might be biased towards you know discouraging men from taking that leave understand how those assumptions on flexible work are wrong so my encouragement would be over time just looking more um, 
recognising the sort of historic bias, but try to undo that in your policies, your procedures, how you're dealing with staff and not making decisions for them on what their personal lives might be because of your assumptions. So when I say that, I think back to how I was even treated when I had my kids and I worked at a very good employer, but certainly the assumption was I would take off 12 months, I might take off more. I, someone said, don't make a return to work plan, you'll fall in love with your baby. And the mm. inference wasn't that you'll fall in love with your baby and a father wouldn't, it was that you'll fall in love with your baby and you won't come back. And I remember how angry that made me at the time because mm. I was really trying to make sure I could have a family and have a career. Um, so employers, and when I say employees, I mean every manager and every worker has carries those views, but understand how they are driving kind of and pressuring and also determining outcomes that mightn't be the best thing for the business. And, and your research shows isn't the best thing for families either. Mm, okay. Okay, well, so we have got some questions coming through. And so there is, there's one here from Luke at the fatherhood and what I'm going to do is I'm going to say the question and then leave it just to sort of marinate with the parent panellists to maybe finish up on because I thought it would be a good one to finish up on but I'm going to say what the question is now just to ensure that everyone has a bit of time to think it through but he makes the point that the Wall Street Journal recently ran the headline that coronavirus will permanently change how we work so what does each member of the panel think will be the single most positive change for working parents? So I'm gonna save that for the end because I think that's a really nice place to end. But in the meantime, um, another question here is, um, and this has, been, this has been brought up a little bit, but we might hear maybe from some other panelists. Um, so how can we really approach decreased employee productivity which would understandably be impacted by parents need to care for their children, but whose mental health is also being affected and preventing them from focusing 100% on their work. Um, so would anybody like to jump in there? I know it's difficult when I can't actually see you, but um, anyone? It is hard. You almost need to say say her name right. and give us a go. I don't know. <laughs> it's Kate here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I think all of those things. I I do I do think I have a lot of confidence that we have a, an ability to rapidly um, learn as we go. But I think whether there's children or not, I'm really conscious that my EA is now working at home. She hasn't worked at home. She doesn't have. Um, you know, high carer responsibilities, but the adjustment in the short term is is going to change our productivity. And I think that all businesses are being very understanding of that. But over time, I think that um, the, the caring, I think us being really explicit and understanding and learning that, I think we'll learn that faster. I think there's lots of people who have worked from home who've had caring that we can learn from. Um, and the other thing that I would say is on the flip side, without travel time, and I'm talking even just the normal commute that's sort of 40 minutes to an hour for most people, uh, to get that time back really contributes to your productivity as well. So I think it's a mixed bag. I think that mental health point though is the number one that we really, you know, that interacting with people is such an important part of how we, how we work and how we're productive and how we are as people. So we need to really learn quite rapidly how we can use the technology to interact. The other night I had some drinks on Zoom. There were four of us that normally catch up, but we all live in a different state and we don't catch up that frequently. And in fact, it was probably more um, helpful than trying to get in the same state at the same time. Mm. Uh, Grant, I might actually ask you the same question just about that in terms of ensuring uh, that in that you know that we can understand the employee productivity might decrease if they need to look after their, their children so what approach can they take and I asked because you mentioned that, that you've made that move to agile working that your firm is quite well adjusted to having people work from home so so you might have some ideas or advice around that question I suppose I don't necessarily agree with the assumption um, 
my mm. personal experience with people working with me is that they've been highly productive um, from different mm. environments and looking after um, children at home and, and elsewhere. So um, I think if people are, are given a mix of, of uh, or opportunities to work in the way that they really would like to work and that that can fit with their personal life, then they're inherently more productive as a result of that. So that's what mm. I thought. That's great, thank you. Okay, well, what I might do is, I mentioned that question from Luke, which I wanted to end on, and I can see that it is four minutes to two, and I wanna make sure that people can get back to whatever they need to get back to. Um, there are lots of other questions, and um, at the end, I might get Emma just to, to, to talk to those questions a little bit and just finish off to let us know what we can do with some of those questions that have come up. But in the meantime, I'll go back to what Luke mentioned about how coronavirus will permanently change how we work um, and we've spoken to bits and pieces of that throughout this conversation but I'd love if each panelist could share one key single positive change for working parents and Sarah I might start with you. For me I think the key point is one that I mentioned earlier which is there will be a shift in attitude because via um, this crisis we'll be able to see that there is a much, much wider range of roles that can be done remotely and be done successfully. Mm, right, okay. Uh, Kellyanne, what do you think? Uh, yes, yeah, similarly, I, I think it will change the response that I usually get from employers about when a request for flexible work can be accommodated. But I also think, I saw a mem on social media this week that said, Never again will a stay-at-home mother be asked what she does all day. Um, <laughs> uh, something to play here because I think that um, co-workers and co-parents who are not doing the majority of things at home will necessarily great, get a greater appreciation for the juggle that working parents have, have had to endure for a while. Absolutely, definitely. Um, and Grant, what do you think? I think the single positive thing out of this is that we'll think about everything differently after this, mm -hmm. that we will start to question many things that as a society we didn't question previously. And I think that's a good thing. And finally, Kate. Thank you. I, I want to take grants. I, I agree with that, thinking about everything differently, valuing different workers, uh, but in particular valuing that flexible work is productive work and not will lose that old attitude that if you're working flexibly you're really slacking off so i hope that will change great well thank you so much to all our panelists emma i believe you're still there i'll hand yeah. over to you maybe you could share a little bit more that came from the questions and some ideas on what might happen with those questions from here on yes thank you angela and thanks to all the panelists thank you to everyone for bearing with us with the technology as well. Um, I just wanted to point out, yeah, we've had a couple of really good questions around dealing with the self-isolation, um, compounding the issues that we've been talking about and what companies do to um, support people through this time. And, and we had a, a number of questions relating to that. And I thought it's a good note to end on because we are looking at putting in place some special webinars to support people. Um, basically, you know, those in place to help managers uh, effectively lead a team remotely and also thinking around individuals and how we can help them prepare to work at home and care. Because for everyone, it's going to be completely different, um, and particularly those that are caring for sick individuals and family members. Um, that's going to be particularly difficult. Um, so we have got that in place. I also wanted to say that if you hadn't had a chance to learn more about the National Working Families Report, um, you can download that from the site here. Uh, it's a good read and will really put into perspective some of the challenges that we've been talking about today, even before COVID-19. So as we've said, this is really going to, um, you know, obviously amplify a lot of the issues that were raised in there. And I think that it is a great opportunity for employers to rethink the way that we manage work and family life and that we could see a better knitting together of work and family policy um, in a way that we've never seen before. So I too remain optimistic and I think this is a great um, opportunity to, to um, yes, as I said, reinvent. So um, thank you very much, Angela. Thank you, thank you for having me, Emma. 
Okay, and thanks to all our panellists. And uh, if there's any questions that you want to know that weren't answered, uh, you can certainly contact us at info at parentsatwork.com.au and we'll do our best to answer them. Thank you to all our panellists and thank you for all our attendees. Wishing everyone a safe um, week ahead um, amidst yeah, some really difficult circumstances. So thinking of you and thank you again.